Uh, I'm ready to go, and I hope you are too. Smith in a gun with Gore on his left hip. Third down, Alex takes the snap. Alex looking, got it. Post, and it's got it. On. Touchdown. Touchdown, 49 oh! Ooh, that gives me chills every single time I hear it. You could feel it in Candlestick. I was there that night. We beat Drew Brees, a legendary performance he had against us. And it it really is one of my favorite memories getting to watch Vernon Davis score that touchdown and leap into the crowd right near 10 feet away from me, crying his eyeballs out. A few plays before that was a 39-yard run by Alex Smith. Who knew he even had wheels at the time? Ooh. That play gives me chills. I like that for the intro. Shout out to your boy Niner Faithful DJ for that one. Let's get started. We had some news this week. Uh, Weston Richburg has retired. That's a bit of a hit for our offensive line. The guy had been here for a few years, played with the Giants a few years before that. A young career, young but but talented. He was a really hard player, really hard-nosed bull up there. and uh, I really loved watching that guy play. He He was a consummate professional and to see him go because of injury you hate to see it but you kind of respect it you know you understand that they put their body on the line they want to be able to walk and hold their kids after this and football only lasts so long it's only a 10 or 15 year sport if you're lucky you know or you're Tom Brady uh so shout out to Weston Richburg and, and congratulations on retirement despite for the reasoning you know I hope that your body gets healed I hope you can enjoy the rest of your adult life, and, and we thank you for the hard work you put in for the San Francisco 49ers. And I just want to give a shout-out to your to your goodbye speech, too, saying that you got to finish your career with the greatest franchise in sports. And if you weren't wrong, and the greatest franchise in sports, thank you. And the fans, we thank you for all your hard work and everything you brought to the offensive line. Weston, We'll see you on the sidelines, man. Now you're one of us. Now you're a fan. <clears throat> Players, you know, they get injured. And, and some of them can come back and some of them can't. I, I feel we are definitely in a time here in the NFL now where injuries aren't as demolishing as they used to be. Used to be. You know, last year was a little demolishing for us. But injuries you can come back from. I remember 10, 15 years ago to tear your ACL was – was a death sentence in the NFL. You know, you couldn't be what you used to be. You would never be the player you once were if you tore your ACL. And now it seems like routinely players are tearing it completely and just getting that knee rebuilt with that only surgery they have. And guys are coming back not only 100%, but 110, 150 because the rebuilt knee is better than the one before, you know? I mean, Nick Bosa tore his ACL in college, and he came back to tore his other one, but his other knee has been fine. And we all remember Frank Gore broke both his knees in college. I, now that I think about it, I'm not sure if those were ACLs, but they're major injuries that normally would have ended people's careers, and they were able to come compete at the highest level. Frank Gore, of course, is the third all-time leading rusher in NFL history, and Nick Bosa is going to break that sack record one day, we can hope. With that being said, man, I really hope to get Nick Bosa on the field again soon. I want to see that guy ball. And uh, the injury doesn't seem to have slowed him down. I've watched some workout videos. I've seen him retraining his body to get back in there. He's no stranger to injuries, but I don't think he's a Mr. Glass like some of the fan base think. Uh, so, yeah. So, injuries are a part of the game. And, unfortunately, for Weston Richburg, it, it ended his game. It ended his career. Once again, we thank you for that, Weston, and and good luck with everything moving forward. And and there's no shame in calling it a quit when your body can't compete at the level that you would like it to. There really is no shame in that. There's 
been other players who have had to do that too. You know, I think along the history, some there were some really great players who could have been greatest all time, who who busted themselves. You know, I I journey outside the Niners to think of guys like Bo Jackson, who had that freak injury and he never really played again, and what he could have been. And of course, you know, I remember guys like Garrison Hurst when he went down for the Niners, the whole season crumbled when when he blew his knee out. Uh, injuries, man, they're part of it. I, I When I played football for the couple years that I played in school, I, I had injuries and decided, man, I'm I'm not sure I'm tough enough for this one. So I could, I could definitely respect the fact that he understands he wants to walk the rest of his life or he wants to be able to use his shoulders in, in Weston's case. He wants to be able to pick up kids that he has or pick or do things the rest of his life. And to, be, to retire because of injury as bad as it is, it, it's respectable and I respect him for it. Uh, what that means for San Francisco moving forward, though, it, it was what I heard. He was a big piece of the puzzle when it came to the offensive line because of his ability to play almost any role on the offensive line. I saw Richburg line up at tackle, at guard, at center. And wherever Shanahan needed him, he would be the dog up in there. And, and you know, I really, really liked watching him play, and I think it's going to be a bit of a hit for our offensive line. Had Shanahan not used his offseason, he could kind of rebuild it. You know, Alex Max is going to be that kind of guy up in there. We still have Lakin Tomlinson, who I really like. <clears throat> of course, we have the best left tackle in, in the NFL, and Trent Williams. And, and I really think that McGlinchey's going to have a bounce back year out there. When it comes to right guard now, it's wide open. I mean, we have we drafted Aaron Banks, who's a big, big mauler kind of guy. But it's yet to be seen what he's going to turn into. It's yet to be seen if that size will translate to speed that a Shanahan offense runs in. I hope it does, but that's a position battle we can keep an eye on headed into training camp and preseason is right guard. I, I'm really going to be interested to see who plays that because we know what the other four positions on the offensive line are when it comes to starters or first stringers. And Weston Richburg was going to be that guy should he have been able to recover. But now we know that it is a position battle. That's official. You can eat that up. Uh, with that being said, I, I wanted to say that uh, I forget what game it was. I think it was week 14. Week 14 versus the Saints was his final game. So if you remember that game, it was 2019 during our Super Bowl run. That was Weston's last game that he played. And uh, what a game that turned out to be. I mean, he, he clearly laid it on the line to uh, for us to pull that one off. So, so yeah, one last time, goodbye, Weston Richburg. <clears throat> Moving forward, I hope we don't have many retirements at the end of this season. I, I don't like when players retire, especially because of injuries. I definitely don't like when they get hurt. I hope that we have done a better job in our front office, in our training room, to be able to – pull it together and not have as many injuries this year. I think injuries are the sole reason why we couldn't compete last year to the level that we wanted to. I was actually pleasantly surprised last year the way we did compete. There was a lot of those games that we were one or two plays out. And if it wasn't for bad quarterback play, we would have been in football. And I don't think bad quarter play, quarterback play happens this year. Jimmy Garoppolo is going to play well. He always plays well. He's going to come in here. He's going to do Jimmy G things. He's going to continue to work on his footwork and get better. And then if he does go down, if the injury bug hits him, we're going to watch Trey Lance come in and take over. And Trey Lance had everything but up to go. So I'm not worried about the quarterback play. And this puts the rest of our team into a very hopeful position when it comes to shooting the playoff. So get excited, 49ers fans. Get excited. Uh, when it comes to other pieces of the puzzle that we might be forming over the next couple of weeks during all these workouts and training camp and things like that, uh, I want to talk about our wide receivers. Uh, so far, our wide receivers, we have Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, uh, Mohamed Sanu, Jalen Hurd, Benny Fowler, Travis Benjamin, Kevin White, Richie James Jr., and Juwan Jennings, all of which are capable of, in my opinion, being at least a uh, third or second wide receiver on a roster. Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel are pretty much tandem for, for wide receiver one on our team. They're, they're one and two, and they're going to they're gonna mix and match and be all over the place and play outside and play inside. 
you're going to see a lot of different positions for them, but they're, they're the top two. And, and it's hard to say who the number one is. You could argue that down in the comments if you want. Uh, I will say that if Jalen Hurd can be healthy and stay in, Jalen Hurd is the most tight wide receiver who's never played a regular season game that I've ever seen. He played one preseason game. He made the Dallas Cowboys look silly. Uh, he looks like a red zone machine for a guy who came out of the college as a running back, being known for running run plays and not, not wide receiver work, but he's big. And Kyle Shanahan wanted a guy that could run like a running back and catch like a red zone threat. And the first preseason game, he did that. Since then, with his back injury and then his ACL last year, that we go back to those ACLs being rebuilt, Baylor Hurd's one of those guys who's rebuilt his knee and is ready to compete. Will he be as impactful as he was in that one game? Time will tell. He definitely has a lot of hype around him when it comes to his teammates. I, I see his teammates always talking about him a lot, always really hyping him up, really getting him going. I, I see uh, Jimmy Garoppolo can't wait to get him out there. He's worked with him a little, and he can't wait to get him out on the field. And, and I wouldn't be shocked if he comes out, has a two-touchdown game, puts the NFL on notice, and says, yeah, the 49ers had a number one wide receiver this entire time. And I think that that's exciting. I think that he is definitely the third wide receiver on the roster, despite his injury. He's third right now. That's just the hype. That's the one game he played. He, he's already that talented in my eyes. He just needs to stay healthy. After Jalen Hurd, we're going to have a bit of a position battle. Some of these guys might make it on the roster by the end of preseason. Some of them might not. We're going to have Travis Benjamin out there, Benny Fowler we signed out of, out of Jacksonville. Kevin White was a guy, when he was drafted, I really kind of hoped the Niners went out and get him. We were really needing a wide receiver at that time. And uh, Chicago, drafting early, went up and got him. But Kevin White was always a wide receiver that I watched in college that I, was, that I thought would be a threat for the 49ers. He, he has that big body ability that you see, you know, who he is, zone type wide receiver. He just never really had a quarterback in Chicago that could get it to him. You know, those wide receivers that come out of those bad quarterback situation teams, they still have a lot to go for them. They they play with the same talent level they came out of college with. They have a bigger chip on their shoulder. That chip is huge for Kevin White right now because I think he very much feels like he got the short end of the stick in Chicago. He never really produced outside of Alshon Jeffrey and Allen Robinson once he got there. The quarterback couldn't really find their third or fourth lead, so they were never going to find Kevin White. And I think that the quarterback situation we have now with Jimmy and Trey and our coach, Kyle Shanahan, I think they're going to find ways to use guys like Travis Benjamin and Kevin White and Benny Fowler in ways that other teams couldn't because they came from organizations with bad quarterbacks. I think these guys definitely are very talented. They, and if Shanahan didn't be too talented, then they wouldn't be here. That's one thing with our coach you have to remember. That these guys, they're all talented because if they weren't, we have good enough judges of talent in the front office with John Lynch and up on the sidelines with Coach Shanahan. And our, and our wide receiver coach, Wes Welker. I mean, Wes Welker's a Super Bowl champion. He leads the league in, in all-time reception. He's playing for Tom Brady and the Patriots. He, he teaches our wide receivers how to go out there and catch. You wonder why Debo and Brandon Ayuk have been able to come out the gate and run those slant routes, run those drag routes, catch it, and go and burst. Not only are they good at it, but they're being taught by one of the best all-time slot receivers. So they play slot receiver no matter where they're lined up on the field. And it's something that is so exciting to watch because you never know where Debo's going to take it when he catches the ball. You just know he's going to end in the end zone. Man, Debo's physical, too. When I said that, I just had this picture of Debo just running through people, people trying to tackle him, trying to leg tackle, arm tackle. you got to run through that guy because he's running through you. Uh, with that being said, we have another wide receiver on our team, too, who has a little bit of hype to him, but not as much backstory or push. Hype to the true fans who kind of watch wide receivers a lot in college. Uh, Vaughn Jennings, he has talent. He has speed. His route running is really crisp. When you see him out there running those routes, he can turn on a dime. He's one of those guys that also, because of injury, missed his opportunity last year as a rookie. But 
Could he stay healthy this year? I think the competition is up in the air enough after the two wide receiver that he could build himself a spot on this team. It, it is so up in the air outside of Debo and Brandon IU that any one of these guys could become that third wide receiver. And also at any moment, Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch could pull the trigger and bring another one. So right now in these OTAs and these team meetings and these training camps and all these times you have to show the coach, hey, look at me, look what I can do. These guys are competing every second that they're out there. They're, they're trying to de- develop relationships with both quarterbacks. The Niners have two quarterbacks right now. It's a very happy, bad situation to be in. we we got two quarterbacks. We don't know who's going to be the starter years from now. You can't really say either of them are a franchise quarterback because we don't know who the face is anymore. We think it's Jimmy for now, but it could be Trey. And the wide receivers are having to do their job at develop relationships with both because you don't know who's going to play. You just don't. I see Benny Fowler out there talking to Trey Lance. He wants to be part of the Trey area. I saw, saw a video of him laughing. He, he wants to be part of the Trey area. You know, you know he's about that height. Uh, speaking of bringing people in, there was some reports this week that a former 49er tight end who chose to take a year off last year for personal reasons, probably COVID, probably to heal a bit. Uh, Delaney Walker, a uh, personal favorite, actually, a player of mine, actually. Uh, I used to call him mini Kanye West. Cause he was dead on on uh, Kanye. Uh, he's coming in for a workout with us, trying to, trying to get back onto the Niners, trying to restart that, that glory that he had here. There was a time there when him and Vernon Davis were running tandem tight ends. They looked better than anybody out there. Alex Smith was hitting both of them. He looked really, really good before he left in free agency and went and signed with Tennessee. He had a few years. I think from a fantasy football point, he kind of fizzled out. I only know that because I tried to draft him. Uh, but, yeah, Delaney Walker coming in for a workout. I know today we signed another Tennessee Titan tight end, a former one, McGill. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. I'm pretty sure that's his name. Uh, that doesn't really bode well for Delaney if we already signed another one, but uh, you never know. It's training camp. We can have 90 people. So why not bring a few in and see how they play with our offense, see how they learn, and see what happens. The workout doesn't always mean a signing, but one, a signing of the same position doesn't always mean you failed your workout. You know, time, time will tell on that one. But the news right now, uh, we did sign a tight end today after the workout, and it wasn't Delaney. I was hoping for Delaney Walker. I like the way he plays. He's physical. He's in a run game. He's always been a really good run blocking tight end, which I know the position is moving towards a more versatile, hybrid version of the tight end. All of the George Kittles and Travis Kelsey, these guys that can block and run and take you out, make you think they're doing one and then move the other. Delaney, I feel, was kind of one of the first people to start doing that. He was a really good run blocker, but he could catch it. And he had some, he had some hands every now and then. I mean, he, he had some drops too, but not, not terrible. Not a Kendrick Bourne style. Sorry to the Kendrick Bourne fans out there. I know you guys, I know you guys love your Kendrick, but I'm glad Stone Hands Bourne is gone. <clears throat> Uh, speaking of gone, Ronald Blair followed Robert Salah to New York Jets today, or yesterday. He, he signed with them, put out a post to the Niners, and it was really heartfelt about his time and the effort the organization gave into him recovering and everything he learned from the players he got to play with and playing for the Niners and what it meant to him. It was, go give that a read. Look at Ronald Blair's goodbye note to the 49ers. It, it truly is a a little bit of a tearjerker if you're on the sentimental side of the sport. Um, I liked Ronald. I thought he was a great depth player. We got a few more depth players and younger ones. So what he was going to end up costing just didn't make sense. And that, you know, that's the way of the sport. Uh, good luck in the future, Ronald. Uh, I'm sure Robert Salah is glad to have you, having worked with you already. But you're going to do good things wherever you go. We, we know that. Um, yeah. So I hope everyone's having a good hump day. I thank you very much for tuning into Prime Time. Of course, this is something I've long wanted to do, and I'm really happy to give the opportunity to do it. I love talking Niners. If you're a diehard 49er fan, do me a favor and drop some comments down and just tell me your favorite play ever. Have we listened to that 
that play at the beginning in my intro clip. And I'd have to say that's my favorite play ever. It was Alex Smith, game on the line. Vernon Davis hits that flat route. He's completely covered, but positions himself with the box out, catches it on the one and flies through the end zone and flies through the defender. That, that was easily my favorite play in Niner history. And I know a lot of you old school guys would be like, what about the cat? What about this one? Or what about that? And, you know, those were all great. But I was at that game with, with the cat three, they call it. I was at, I saw Vernon Davis catch it. I still get the same chills every time I hear it or every time I see it on TV. That whole game was wild. That, from the moment Dante Hitner popped the air, Thomas out cold, to the very, very end when Vernon Davis caught that pass, it was just wild. My my sister is a Saints fan, and, and we were just at each other's throats the whole game. It was, it was the craziest thing. You really felt like whoever was going to pull that game off was going to go to the Super Bowl. And the Niners very well could have if it wouldn't have been for the loser that fumbled the football on the kick return. I don't even remember his name. I'm glad I don't. So yeah, that that was that was my favorite play. My favorite play is the catch three by Vernon Davis. What's your favorite play? Go ahead and leave that in the comments. I want to know. I want I want everyone to feel like uh, like they have a voice. So so please don't be afraid. To to interact with me, I got them right here. Jump on and, and tell me your favorite play in Niner history. I think there's some other good ones. You know, we have the Candlestick Six Six by Navarro Bowman, you know. The monster of the midway. I think <clears throat> I think Navarro Bowman six six was very, very, very magical because it was the last game in Candlestick. It was the last play. The Falcons were driving, they were gonna beat us. It, they had a terrific red zone offense that whole season. Navarro Bowman picks it off, takes it to the house. Big old Bowman takes it to the house. Oh, that, that gave me chills, too. Are, are you the kind of Niner fan that gets chills when you talk about it? I, every time I talk about those plays, I, my, from head to toe, it's just complete chills, complete chills. Uh, some old school ones, of course, the catch, I, I remember uh, – Deion Sanders and, and Jerry Rice going at it. I remember a lot of those 90s plays. But, yeah, so if you're an old school fan and, and you know some plays that maybe us younger crowds don't remember, you know, there's some plays that still give you chills after all these years. Drop them in the comments and we'll, and we'll discuss them. Uh, I want to give a shout-out to uh, – not... <laughs> I was going to talk about uh, Delaney Walker all over again, but I guess I already covered that one. Excuse me. Okay. So, coming up next, we have, we're have we going to talk about a few things. I, I'm going to talk about my hopes for the future, my hopes for the Niners moving forward. You know, we've, we spent time covering the schedule and what we think the schedule is going to look like. But I'm going to kind of jump into um, my real, real over-the-top hopes uh, and dreams for this team, some of which – our Super Bowl aspirations. One, I truly believe that we are going to sweep the NFC West this year. And I know there's a lot of a lot of fans that are like, I don't know, that's not realistic. But I, I think it is. I, I think it's very realistic to think about. You have a team in the Pacific Northwest that isn't necessarily what they used to be. They still have a quarterback that can play, but they have a lot of other areas where they are pretty – getting pretty weak, getting pretty thin, and I don't see them being as dominant as they once were. I think the locker room issues with Russell Wilson and his team are adding up. I think that the Seahawks are one of those teams where dysfunction is starting to kind of eat away at them. They've done a good job at handling that before. They definitely have some good players like DK Metcalf and, and some former Niners on their defense now, but but, yeah, I really don't see them being the top tier team they once were or even the most scary team that they once were. They're still going to play the heck out of the 49ers. They always do, even when they weren't good. So I don't see them being easy games. But I do feel like we're going to sweep the Seahawks pretty handedly. Uh, the first time 
we play them, I think I think it's probably going to be a blowout. I don't think they're going to be ready for it. And then they're going to come back prepared a little, but we'll still pull that one off. When it comes to the Arizona Cardinals, I think the Cardinals are the scariest opponent we have in the NFC. I think Kyler Murray is getting better. I think the thought of DeAndre Hopkins anytime you play him is a little nerve-wracking. I think their defense is getting stronger. Some people put them as a fourth team in this division, but I, I think we're number one and they're going to be number two. And I wouldn't be surprised if they slip into the playoffs somehow and give us a memorable rivalry game from playoffs. I, I really wouldn't. I think their coach is either going to make or break himself this year, and I don't think he's going to break himself. I, I think the Cardinals are going to look good. They're going to play good. And we might split that, that series this year, but I really think that we've kind of had their number the past couple years, and they played us in really tight games, but we're going to give them our all, and, and they're going to they're gonna hurt after playing us. We, we owe them a few. That's for sure. We owe them a few. Uh, moving on to the L.A. Rams. Uh, they're the other team in the division. They're kind of up in the air, but a little better off right now than I'd say the Seahawks are. They spent a lot of money to be an elite team, and I wouldn't consider them an elite team. So their future is a little more up in the air. I think that right now, with the money they've spent and the people they have coaching them, Sean McVay, the second best coach in the NFC West, uh, I think that they're a threat any time. And I I said the Cardinals are going to pull it off and, and get that number two spot in the division, but the Rams very well could. They, they could have a monster year. They still have the best defensive linemen outside of Nick Bosa. They still have a plethora of wide receivers that God knows can beat you at any moment. And now they have a better quarterback with Jared Goff leading. And Matt Stafford coming in. Uh, time will tell if Matt Stafford will play to his abilities that he had for years with the Lions. Time will tell if the Lions made him look worse. Maybe he's better. Maybe on a team with all these wide receivers, Matt Stafford's about to show us how good he's always been. But I don't see it. I think Matt Stafford's getting too old. I think he's going to collapse under the pressure of the different defensive types that come in from the NFC West. I can see the Cardinals and the Niners and the Seahawks having field days with Matt Stafford. I don't consider him an elite quarterback like some do. I consider him having the possibility to be one, and definitely he has an elite strong arm. If you throw some fast or big wide receivers out there, he can get it to the heat. But to run the mechanics and be smart of a Sean McVay or a Shanahan-style offense, you have to have a little more IQ between the years, and, and Matt Stafford doesn't. I, I think that he's just an arm, and just an arm is not going to survive in the NFC West. So the Cardinals down, Seahawks down, LA down. You know, that's some big wins right there. That's six wins on the season before you even really play other people. So the Niners are already going to be looking good if we can pull off beating the NFC West in both games that we played in this season. Naturally, that's always the goal. You always want to beat the NFC West. And I don't think it's too far out there for us to think we're going to. I think that they're good teams. I think some of them are better than others. I, you know, the Rams and the Cardinals look a little better than the Seahawks to me. I don't like any of them. But this is one of the first years in a while where I think, you know what, I actually think that we can beat them all three of them, both times, and set ourselves up with six wins outside of our division, and that would be huge. You know, we travel a little bit again this year. Our schedule is definitely not as hard as it's been the last couple of years. That's going to work in our favor. You, we had these hard schedules the last couple of years. The year before, it, it doomed us to get to the Super Bowl, and last year, it completely decimated us. So this year, having a little bit easier strength of schedule, if we win those division games, I can see us riding off into the sunset with a, with a solid 13 or 14 win season. And, and I don't think I'm too crazy to think that. I, I, I really have confidence in this team. Of course, it's all based off of should this happen? Should this player come back? 
should this player stay healthy? But if all the shoulda, coulda, wouldas are answered in positive ways, there is no reason this team can't make a Super Bowl run, or let alone, at the very least, win out our division. Our division is the best division in football, and I see us, from a football fan standpoint, being extremely better than all three of those teams. You know, we can argue if you'd like, but I don't see an Iron fan that wants to argue for another team very often. But that's just the way I see it. And then you look at all those other games that we play, and, and there's not really terrifying ones out there. There's some games where it's like, mm, that's a little toss-up. That team plays everybody really well. It's not. But there's not really scary teams to play this year like there once was. There's no gauntlet of teams where we're going to have to run through three or four away games and test ourselves in the middle of the season. I think our biggest challenge this season is the early fight. We have a pretty early bye week, and with an extended season, now an extra game and playoff, if, if we don't somehow get that first round bye in the playoff, I definitely can see um, a cushion setting into these guys. Sorry, I had to think of that word. It's a little bit too big a word for me. But yeah, the the attrition will set in, and and I think having that early bye week for a team that has had a lot of injury history, I can see that being a problem. I can see some of the guys getting a little burnt out. So I hope my hope is that in this off season they're doing a, a, a pretty major hell week. I, I hope they're working cardio, eating right, staying hydrated. You don't want these guys breaking down midway through the season because we had an early bye week and there's no stopping. You know, you play a game once a week, but it's week after week after week. And this isn't baseball, folks. This is coming at you full speed like a freight train football. And to play that game, this game week after week after week, it sets in. And there's a reason that they don't play 82 games like baseball or, or football or basketball with. With this being the first season that has an extra game, players aren't going to know what that extra game does to them, really. Most of these players never play more than 16 games a season. There's a lot of teams out there that only play 16 games because they never make the playoffs. They only, and you're, if you're on a team like the Lions and you've never played a 16-game season in your life or more than a 16-game season in your life because you've never made the playoffs, and then you get traded or picked up by a team like, you know, the Patriots who who are going to go deep to, to they have this season, or like us who are going to go deep in the season, then that becomes something you have to focus on when you're training. You have to focus on attrition. You have to eat right, hydrate, stretch. You have to do it all every single day, every single day of your life. Because week 16, week 17, when you're playing for playoff spots and these guys in your division or these guys in other conferences, they've lost a few and they know if they beat you, they're going to make the playoffs. Well, that's when they find their third and fourth gear. And that's when you have to have a fifth and sixth gear. You have to be able to turn it up and turn it on without wiping yourself out for playoffs. Early bye week will be our biggest challenge this year. But I see last year and all the challenges we faced in the injury or fishing game, I feel like our coach is smart enough to have installed things that are going to fight that. I don't I don't think our team's gonna look as demolished as it did last year. I don't honestly see how that's even possible. Uh I I would have to double check, but I don't think we play at MetLife this year. If if we do, correct me. Um I really hope we don't play at MetLife this year. That it's one of the worst fields I've ever seen. It, it wiped so many different players on so many different teams out last year. It, <clears throat> Robert Spaha gets a job at the New York Jets. He watched his entire defense crumble playing on that field last year. And now he's supposed to go out there and hype his guys up for home and field advantage. Good luck with that. Uh, but yeah, so, <clears throat> so we talk about this. We talk about how you have to prepare yourself and you have to get ready for that. What do you think are some ideas? Drop them in the comments. You know, what, what are some ideas this team could do to help better themselves in the long run? You know, we coach talks about you got to think week to week to week, but with an extended season and not knowing what that's going to do on your body, 
nutritionally, I think you should start thinking about that right now. And then don't ever forget it. It needs to become a lifestyle. It needs to become a way these athletes train. You're going to see with this longer season, some guys are going to be depleted in the playoffs. There's going to be players where it's like, why did why did he play like that in the wild card round? Because it's an extra week more than he's ever played. It may not seem like that much, but it really is something that you could have a hard time coming to grips with. Uh, one of those guys I really hope is Jimmy Garoppolo. I mean, while his has never been a stamina issue and probably never will be because you don't see him running very often, I hope he's doing the same that are beneficial for him as a statue getting hit. I've already seen little signs of him having grown in that area. He showed up training camp both steps. His arms and legs are bigger. So you can tell he's trying to add some weight to create some more muscle around his ligaments and bones. He's trying to get stronger, and that's a good thing. And that, I was happy to see that. When he, when he was walking into the stadium that first day of OTA, I, I saw how big he looked. I commented it last week on prime time. He, he was looking real big. And he was looking swole even. And I thought to myself, man, that guy is really taking care of himself. And I think if you have an off season where it's like, hey, my ankles hurt. I can't do much. I'm going to go. I'm going to lift the weight. And I'm going to get bigger up top. I'm going to get stronger. One of the things that Epper talks about Jimmy Garoppolo's weaknesses is his ability to throw the ball downfield. I don't agree. I've seen him throw the ball downfield plenty of times. But those big muscles are going to make it to where he can do it again and again and again. You bulk up when you don't want your bones or your ligaments to break, but you also need to stretch. And so I hope that what we see with the bulking up also gets translated in what he does day to day and free game. We need him to stay hydrated. We need him to stretch yoga style stretches, stretch so much to where you could bend your own knees left and right and it doesn't hurt you. You, he has to be prepared for that because if anybody on this team, he can at least afford an injury this year. I think if George gets hurt or Devo or any of the other guys that have had a couple injuries over the last couple of years, the one that can't afford it the most is Jimmy Garoppolo. Because if Jimmy Garoppolo gets hurt, Trey Lance takes over this team and Garoppolo never sees a starting line again. And I, I'm guaranteed of that. No matter how good he is, that's how this game works. If you're a starting quarterback and you lose your job to a rookie, you're not being signed as a starter. You're not going to sign a $100 million contract. That's for sure. You're going to get picked up by a team that maybe wants your talents, but no, you're not as expensive. In Jimmy's case, he's, he would go and get picked up by the Patriots and work for Belichick and perhaps earn his way as a starter again, but he won't make that starter money. He won't be that lauded of a guy moving forward. If he has even one more single injury, his whole goal this year should be stay healthy. If Jimmy Garoppolo stays healthy, his talent will make him play enough to where he doesn't need his job. If he can stay healthy, we can go to a Super Bowl. His win rate is incredible, so you know he has the talent to do it. But it's going to be about health. And we, we revert back to the early bye week. Does that translate on Jimmy Garoppolo? Does that make him think about, okay, now I have an extra game I, that I have to prepare for. I, I've already not really been able to prepare for 16 games. Do I have it in me to prepare for one more? I think he does. I, I, I like to think that he hired a right, the right team around him. I like to think that he's eating right. I like to think that he's stretching because whether he admits it or not, they just drafted. They just traded three first-round draft picks to draft a rookie quarterback. Jimmy Garoppolo's job is not safe. He is in the hot and that seat is burning. He better light that fire under his ass and jump because it's happening this season. This is make or break for Jimmy Superman Garoppolo. <clears throat> and I, I want so bad to see those interviews, to watch his smile at the end of the game and watch him winning again. I want him to make the playoffs, and I want a reporter to ask him, you made it an entire season, you didn't get hurt, the rookie didn't take your job, and you guys are headed to the NFL playoffs. How does that feel? Feels great, baby. I can't wait for it. Because the moment he says those words again, the moment he looks at Aaron Andrews with that twinkle in his eye one more time, 
And she says, you guys are going to the playoffs. How does that feel? And he says, feels great, baby. Every fan, every doubter, every hater, they're going to leap off their seat. And they're going to hurt their hands clapping so hard. That's going to feel great, baby. That's going to feel great. But you have to start focusing on those things right now. You have to focus on attrition right now. Because if you don't, nothing's going to feel great. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt sitting on that sideline knowing, actually, I'm healed now. But Trey Lance is taking off. It's going to hurt sitting at home with your leg up on the couch as you heal and watching Trey Lance get completely covered by the media because he scores one touchdown. It's going to hurt more than an injury this time. So I hope he's starting now. But I do believe in him. And I think that's something different that a lot of the people in my position talking about this team on the internet aren't going to give him credit for. I, while I think that he could be injured, and I've seen progress towards not getting injured, I feel like Jimmy Garoppolo is going to make something happen. There's too much firing him up. He comes into camp focused up and ready. I know he's focused on the stretching. I know he's focused on the hydration. I know he's focused on staying in that football game. I saw a video the other day. He was focused on his footwork. Footwork makes the plays work. Everybody knows that as a quarterback. Your footwork is very, very important. And up to this point, Jimmy Garoppolo's footwork has been mediocre. He was working on it. He was showing Trey how to do it. He was saying, hey, look at this pad. Don't move your feet outside of it. Keep it, keep, keep it slow. It was a cool video to watch. You should just check that out. I think that's on 49ers.com. Uh, it, was, it showed Trey and Jimmy kind of running it. I actually thought Trey was a little better, though. His footwork was much faster, much more fluid. You could tell Jimmy is still working on his, but there's no pain. So that's a good sign. He was stomping those feet down without a wind. He was able to turn his hip and fire. His passing mechanics was way more smooth than Trey. You know, you watch the you watch the feet, and, and, and one of them is going slow, and the other one's going real fast. But then you look up, and Jimmy's turning that hip like a champion, and whipping that shoulder, and putting that ball where it needs to be. The ball comes out perfect spiral. Trey Lance, really good footwork, but his hips came out a little wide, and his his arm was a little high. And his ball didn't look as bullety or perfectly narrow as Jimmy's did. So, and those are the things that we all know. Those are things that we are coming into this position battle, if you want to call it that. No, and we know Jimmy Garoppolo can throw the ball better than Trey Lance right now. Right now. The thing about Trey Lance is his ceiling is so high. What could it be after a little bit of work with Kyle and, and the guys? What could it be after a little bit of progression in chemistry with the wide receivers. You know, you got Debo and Brandon Ayu. And we know what Jimmy looks like with them. What does Trey Lance look like with them? What does Trey Lance look like with Muhammad Sanu? What does Trey Lance look like with Jalen Hurd? Maybe Trey Lance and Kevin White will just link up and just be so deadly together because they're in each other's brain. You know, we time will tell all of these things. I'm talking about it now is just something I like to do because I enjoy talking Niner football. But I'm going to tell you right now, if those wide receivers and those quarterbacks aren't on the same page, we're going to see it on game day. And if they're not on the same page right now, today, in organized team activity, we're going to see it on game day. I love hearing things like Brandon and I used flew out and started training with Trey Lance early. <clears throat> kind of showed his cards a little bit kind of said, hey, I'm going to be the first one to say I'm pretty sure you and I are going to be playing together, so let me come out here and let's start building some chemistry. I don't know who initiated that, but I love to see it. I, I love last year when Debo went out and started doing that with Jimmy D. I mean, I didn't love how that ended. Whatever field they were on, broke Debo's foot. <coughs> Excuse me. But, yeah, that chemistry, that needs to start now, too. I think um, 
I think chemistry is huge when it comes to the passing game, but it's huge when it comes to the entire offense. People say that the defense needs chemistry, and while I do agree to that, the defense is more of a top-down economic kind of thing, in my opinion. I think if you have a good defensive line, that'll trickle to the linebackers, and that'll trickle to the secondary, and then you need to plug in a hard-hitting safety for the year, and you got yourself a defense that can win a championship. Build that pass rush, build that hard-hitting safety, build those linebackers that can cover championship defense. But often, there needs to be a lot of chemistry. The wide receivers have to be on the same page. The quarterback, the running back has to be a wide receiver in the same aspect. The offensive line has to know exactly where to be, where to block, where to push, and they have to know their running back is fast enough to be there or they have to slow down. Chemistry is huge. Chemistry is something that this team is really, 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 really good at. I think it's the moment Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch got here and they started doing brick by brick. You know, brick by brick, you build this this team. And I feel like chemistry is probably one of the most important aspects to a team you can have. And that's what John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan came in here and started instilling in calling, I'm sorry, in this team was chemistry. You know, you got guys like Jimmy Garoppolo and George Kittle, for instance. Look how good they play together. Look how good Jimmy Jimmy G and George Kittle are. And they play so well on and off the field that it translates on the field every single time. The 49ers are on such an uphill right now. It, it is because of that chemistry. It's because they've built a brick by brick. You don't really see a player come onto this team and not be able to gel with the rest of them. You know, you have guys like Quan Alexander and Fred Warner. Their chemistry was incredible to watch. You you got guys like Evo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk, the two of them have played off each other despite having gotten really to play with each other. To see them both healthy, both on the field at the same time, is going to be something new to this offense this season that we should have been able to be gifted last season. It's going to be fun to watch that. I think that's something that, that a lot of the fans aren't talking about that we are going to get treated to this year is what are the cheat codes that Kyle Shanahan uses when, it, when he has everybody on the field. Because he hasn't really had that yet. You know, he hasn't had Debo and Brandon Ayuk and George Kittle most of, and Garoppolo on the field at the, same, at the same time, really ever. And so knowing the talent level on the field come week one to we survive training camp and preseason without injury, the chemistry of those guys is going to be outstanding. I truly, truly am so hyped for it. So I get chills when I think about it. I just fingers crossed, man. Fingers, fingers crossed that we can beat these guys and we can get to the end of this road with a clean bill of health. Because if we make the playoff and everybody's at our disposal, Kyle Shanahan's going to make another Super Bowl run for this team. And you can bank on that. This team is ready for that. This team is prepared. This team has been built brick by brick to be a championship contender every single week. And and we are. We are. You know, I like to I like to say that I look at this game, I look at this team from not just a forty nine er faithful, but from an NFL faithful. I love this sport. And I have no shame in saying, Yeah, yeah, that team's better than my team. I have no shame in saying, you know, my team has so many holes this year, I'm, I don't think it's going to happen. I have no shame in saying, yeah, we got beat in that Super Bowl. Jim Harbaugh called three of the same plays with a, with a quarterback that couldn't make the throw, trying to make him an icon. I When we had the best third best running back of all time back there, I have no shame saying that that was horrible to call. Because I know football, and I know what good football looks like, and I know what bad football looks like. I've watched it my entire life. I've watched every single game 
that the Niners have allowed to be online. I have watched every single game since I've been old enough to watch them. In my family, we had huge traditions for football Sunday. We were the all-American family that wakes up every Sunday, cooks a bunch of food. We treat every single Sunday like it's NFL Sunday. And my wife continues that tradition this year, or this now, I mean, in this time. She has made it to where my kids get to grow up being the same 49er football faithful fans that we are. If, if you're one of us, if, if you're in my family, you're a football fan, and then you have a favorite team. My favorite team is the San Francisco 49ers, and I love them to death. But I can watch this game from a football fan standpoint. And from a football fan standpoint, if I was a fan of any other team that had to play the San Francisco 49ers, I'd be shaking in my boots. If I was an Arizona Cardinal fan, I would be terrified. If I was a Seattle Seahawks fan, I'd be thrown in the town now. If I was an L.A. Rams fan, I'd probably be pretty egotistical and wouldn't know what the hell I was talking about. Because I chose the Rams. But instead, I got gifted with the IQ enough to know who the greatest organization in the history of sports is. And that's the 49ers. And they're going to show that this year. They're going to show that. From an NFL point of view, the 49ers, if they stay healthy, are the scariest team in football. And you, you, could put a, you could put a bet on that one. You could go to Vegas, take a thousand bucks, put it down if the 49ers win 10 or more games and make the playoffs, and you're going to win some money. You could take that all the way if that's happening. With that being said, I, I look down right now when I pointed at the Niners and I saw the black and red. And while we may not see these jerseys this year, rumor has it we're getting another throwback. We saw last year's all white jerseys with the white and the red and black numbers. Well, apparently, Kyle Shanahan is pushing the NFL to let us wear the all red with the black and white from the 90s jersey. And if you're a fan of last year's white ones, you're going to be a fan of, of those 90s jerseys. The, us 90s fans grew up with those jerseys, man. They're, they're beautiful jerseys. When we changed them, I like that we went back to the classics, but now they are classics in and of themselves, and I'm super stoked that we could possibly be wearing those. I was talking with TJ earlier today, and we both agreed that the Super Bowl might have been lost the moment the officials didn't let us wear those all whites. Every time we wore those all whites in 2019, we... Well, we played with such swag. We, in the words of Terry Rice, we looked good, we felt good, we played good. Every time we wore those jerseys, it was just spot on. And now we're going to get the red ones, and we're going to get the same swagger. You're going to get the the red ones that uh, Mr. Primetime himself, Deion Sanders, made famous. Terry Rice, Steve Young, some of the guys to wear that jersey. I'm excited. I want I want to get one. I want to get one. Speaking of getting jerseys, I see a lot of people have Trey Lance jerseys. I have this thing about jerseys. I don't know about you guys, but I don't like to get players who I'm not sure are going to be here for at least five or six more years. People are buying Trey Lance jerseys like he's starting week one. I've seen so many people on these pages being like, oh, look at my Trey Lance jersey. Look at my Trey Lance jersey. I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. Maybe, maybe – Maybe you have enough to spend on all those jerseys. But me, who can probably only get about a jersey a year, I'm not going to get a guy who hasn't played a single down. I'm not going to go out and get a rookie quarterback jersey. I made that mistake with Alex Smith. I'm not going to do it again. You know, I, I get legacy players. I, I get guys who have really made a name for themselves. I get the Navarro Bowman, the Patrick Willis, get a Jerry Rice or a Steve Young. Like Joe Montana, Ronnie Lott, I can go down the list of names, and I'm sure someone out there will be like, who's this guy? Frank Gore, you know. How about you get Frank Gore? But my point is, some players haven't earned the jersey sale, in my opinion. And I don't like when jersey sales happen off of time. To me, that's the marketing playing to the sheep, if you will. I think they build up the hype, and people are like, oh, I must have. I had a jersey before anybody. You know, I had a Trey Lance jersey the day he got drafted and all this stuff. And if you're a jersey collector and you have all 
53 players on the starting lineup come week one, if you got the money to buy those jerseys, then yeah, you got to stay last one. That's pretty tight. You got all of them. That's a heck of a collection. But for me, I'm I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna buy Trey Lance. Jimmy Garoppolo hadn't even earned me buying a jersey, and I know it's the quarterback, and everyone wants the quarterback jersey. But Jimmy G took us to a Super Bowl, and I'm still not ready to buy his jersey. He could sign another six-year contract, and then maybe maybe I'll get I'll sell out the hundred bucks for a jersey to wear for six years. This year, this one here, if I keep it clean, the Royal Bowman stays with me for my life, and I'll be proud to wear it. You know, I, I remember when I was a kid, I had just bought a Jerry Rice jersey. And I know Jerry's the jersey any fan can wear, of course. But I had just got a Jerry Rice jersey. I'd worked up pretty much all summer to have it right before the season started. And being a kid, you don't you don't follow the off season as much. I didn't realize he was already gonna be a race. And when I put on his jersey and my mom, who was a Raider fan, was like, You can't wear that. He's a Raider now. I, I remember crying my eyes out. Hearing that. No, Jerry Rice is always a Niner. He will always be a 49er. And that was the first time I learned what kind of business the NFL was, but also that some players will go to another team and you're ridiculous for wearing that jersey still. Of course, when Jerry retired, the right to win it came back to us. The Raiders can, too. If I ever see a Seahawks fan in a Jerry Rice jersey, I'm going to whoop his ass. <laughs> I'm not serious. Don't call the cops on me. <clears throat> Maybe I am. I, yeah, that's a pretty that's a pretty offensive thing. We only played with them for how long, you know. It was the worst thing in the world to see. Most fans just forgot. Most fans don't even remember. You were like, Jerry Rice played for the Seahawks for a minute. He's crazy. Get out of here, you you faithful listener fan. No, no, you really can't sign with the enemy. You really can't sign with the Rainy City Bitch Business. But it is what it is. You know, I, if, if you're a Raider fan and you rock a Jerry Rice jersey, I mean, he helped to get you a Super Bowl one year. You respect the Bay Area thing, too. You know, I'm, I'm not mad at it. But the rights to wearing the Jerry Rice jersey came back to the night when he retired. You know, while he played by a month. But when he retired, they came back to us. Uh, there's a lot of players like that, you know. I'm, I'm sure a lot of players feel the same way about Deion Sanders, you know. I'm, I mean, at least Cowboy fans, or, or maybe even South fans. You know, there's, I, I'm wondering what it's like for the guys at the quarterback who played for a bunch of different teams, you know, the, like Brett Favre, who was a Packer, but also had some good success with the Jets and the Vikings. Like, did the rights go back to him? Did the rights go back to the, the Packer fans, I mean? I, I imagine it's the same thing as the Jerry Rice jersey. You, want, you know, you wore them while he played for them. He had marginal success with them. But when he retired, the fan base gets their, gets their icon back. And you have other guys who are just gone. You know, like Terrell Owens. Terrell Owens, I'll never buy a CEO jersey. Because I don't believe he respects his time as a man. I think he sees the Niners as a stepping stone to what eventually would make him even though his best years came with us. I think he sees himself more as a cowboy or an eagle. I think he might see himself as a player who played for all three. I was great for all three. You all three should immortalize me, but I'm, I'm one minor fan. I respect his talent. I respect what he did, but I'm also really thankful that he's one of those wide receivers that was tired without a Super Bowl ring because Terrell Owens didn't deserve that glory. I think he did deserve the Hall of Fame that he eventually got, but he acted like CEO about it, and I, I lost a little more respect than I already had. You know, Terrell Owens was a great, great player, but a horrible, horrible human being when it came to how he talked about people or how he competed. You know, I remember one time when he spit at Sean Taylor. Sean Taylor came from the, from the Washington Redskins to pass away. 10 years ago. Uh, the very next play, Sean Taylor hit him. Hit him so hard. Theo got up, took his helmet off, and he was screaming, crying. You know he'd never been hit like that in his entire life. And I remember he was a cowboy then, and I just remember thinking, man, 
The great Terrell Owens reduced the tears on the field from one hit because he was being a punk. You gotta love it. You gotta love it. <sighs> 49ers. You know, I'm coming up on the hour here, and uh, I've been talking for a while. The viewers, you must love my voice if you've been around this long. Uh, I do appreciate you guys. Of course, I appreciate Quick for letting us stream. Uh, I appreciate Niner Faithful Radio for developing the kind of network that allows our faithful fans to have a voice. You know, that's what we're all about here. It, it's for the faithful, by the faithful. So if you're going to get your merchandise anywhere, get it from us on NinerFaithful.com. Uh, with that being said, you know, back to the jersey thing. I think there's one player who's only played for a couple of years I would buy, and that's Nick Bosa. But uh, we'll move on from that. Uh, yeah, so I think I'm going to sign off here. It's been nice talking to you guys. Uh, I'll find a better way to sign off than, yeah, well, here in the future. This is just my second show, so I'm still kind of getting used to the kinks, getting used to how I'm going to do things and, and where I'm going to go from here. Uh, I do enjoy doing this for you all, and, and I enjoy seeing that you watch it. I enjoy making it for you, and I definitely enjoy talking about 49ers. So if you love talking 49ers and you want to be part of this, and you want to jump on and jump onto the comments and, and let us know what you think. Uh, we're very, very proud of Niner Faithful Radio, and we're going to continue to bring you all the news and updates and hopes and dreams moving forward. You know, this is... Uh, twitch.tv slash Niner Faithful Radio. We are NinerFaithfulRadio.com and I am at Mr. Nice Guy 559 on Twitter. Join us every week for Prime Time at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And don't forget to join us Tuesdays at 3 for Niner Faithful Radio. I'm your host, Mr. Nice Guy, a.k.a. Dylan, a.k.a. the biggest fan in the world. Argue me in the comments. Have a great hump day and a great rest of your week, folks.